just remain standing a moment. Um, I want to I address something to you guys that are here right now, to everyone that's tuning in online, on Facebook, on YouTube. I want to I address something. We, we have here in the church a place called the War Room. The War Room is a place of intercession. And we have people that pray before the service and during the service, even, even after the service, people come and they pray, they, they intercede. And one of the, the, the people that is a driving force of that is our personal intercessor. She's a lady of prayer and she gets some things spot on, man, when she gets a word. She, sometimes she has dreams and, you know, it's very biblical and it's spot on and we trust her. She sent us this at the start of the service as a word from the Lord. I want to read it out. This is not me getting this word from the Lord. This is her getting a word from the Lord, but I trust her. And I want to share this with you. So this is for you guys. It's for us. It's for you guys. And also, how many of you know we have a congregation that watches us online as well? You know, we have hundreds of people watching us live online um, at any one service. And he says this. I'm going to quote it. I am exposing the conditions of the heart. Some of you will say I am under attack, but I am showing you the state of your heart so that you can get rid of things in your heart that do not belong. I'm doing greater things now and the heart is my garden. I am the gardener and will bring out whatever is not of me in order to fill you to the fullness of myself. I am holy, said I, the Lord of hosts. I will bring to pass all that has been spoken concerning my church. I am the God of covenant. If I was to hazard a a guess, I would say that there are people that that's spoken to right now. And I want to just pray so that we can pray and we can seal some things that are taking place right now. For those of you that are here, for those of you that are watching online, if that resonated with you, if you feel and sense that, you know, maybe things have been a little bit challenging of late you've things have been coming out of your life you've been squeezed you've been it's easy to say I'm under attack but sometimes what if it's not the enemy that's trying to attack you but it's God that's trying to change you do we recognize God when he comes and moves and prunes our lives when he comes and takes out weeds and roots, he does it at a time and a choosing of himself when he knows the time is right, but he always does it in preparation for what it is that he's about to do. Remember the other week when I preached about breaking up the fallow ground? Huh? Maybe something's being broken up so that there's an opportunity for a seed to be sown so that a new harvest can be realized someday in the future. One thing I know is that no harvest is reaped at the same time the seed is sown. You have to give it time. I also know that no harvest is reaped from a seed that is not sown. So what is it that God's doing in your life right now? I just want you to lift up your hands and just surrender your heart to the Lord. Surrender yourself. Submit to God. Remember last week's service? Huh? About the centurion, a man under authority that had authority, a man in submission that had authority, and Jesus was amazed by his faith because he got it. He got it that his the place he was in was a, a role, it wasn't a destination. Leadership, followership, whatever God's doing in you is preparing you for the work that He wants you to do. Father, in this place today, we just lift up every single heart. 
We are spiritual beings living in an earthly, fleshly world. My God, and you are spirit and you are doing a spiritual work in us so that it will manifest and something will manifest of goodness and holiness in this earthly, terrestrial, fleshly world. God, that you are preparing your people. You're preparing your bride. Help us. Help us. Search out those things, oh God, that don't, don't need to remain anymore. Take them out. Come on, if that's you right now, just say to the Lord, take it out, God. Take out whatever you want to take out in my life right now. Take it out. Break it up. Take it out. Remove it. The attitudes, the fears, the doubts, those old things from your childhood or your teenage years that lodged within you, that have stopped you from living a life of total peace and fulfillment experiences that you've had and things that have crept in from outside, different people's opinions and a need for this and a need for that, even sin that you've allowed to take a hold and take a root within your life. God, take it out right now. In the name of Jesus. Come on, this is a beautiful time right now to get with God in this moment and just say, Lord, here I am. Take my fear, take my doubt, take my guilt, take my shame, take my anger, take my frustration, take my disappointment. Take it away and draw me closer to you. Come on all over this place, just lift up your hands and begin to press into God. Just for a moment, just for a minute, before we go any further in this service, connect with Him and let Him touch you, let Him feel you, let Him reassure you that there is a reason for this season. You might not know how to do it, and I'm sensing that some of you don't know how to do this. You, it's very simple, man. You just lift up your heart and lift up your hands and speak to God and tell Him, Lord, here I am. I trust you. I want to change. Take this from me. And the miracle is that He does. That's the miracle. He does. He changes you from the inside out. Sometimes the circumstances that are all around you disappear in a moment when there is no longer any need. Some things happen because we're living in a sinful world with disease and brokenness. Some things happen because we're living in a sinful state with internal things that take place. Sometimes some things happen and there is, we, 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 we don't even know the reason. We just have to trust God. But in all things, God wastes no thing that takes place in our lives. And He's bringing out something in your life right now of beauty, of, of reality, of wonder, of connection, of community, of relationship, of peace and love and joy and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness, self-control is changing you and growing you and building you. And right now we're building the future. Right now you're building the future. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, seal this time, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Continue to work upon us. As, even as we leave this place, speak to us through the service, and then as we leave this place, even, oh God, continue to work on us. Because you love us so much, you delight in us more than we delight in you many times. Forgive us. Forgive us. And draw us closer to you today. We just want to know you and see what you're doing and do that to please you and bring you glory because we know that you, you love us. Thank you, Jesus. Bless this time of preaching of your word. 
May it reach into our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Please take your seats. It's good to see you in the house of God. Amen. And uh, I mean, you know, God's moving. Right? Even when I can't see him, he's moving. Even when I don't feel it, he's moving. Huh? Praise the Lord. Don't forget these things are to take away, but they're not just to take away and just leave in your house, stick on your fridge with a, a magnet from Marbella or whatever. They're to take away and to give to a neighbor, a friend, a loved one, even an enemy. Imagine that. You might invite an enemy to church. They might get saved, become your friend. Hello. That's one way to get rid of an enemy and not go to prison. Amen. So take these away, give them out. Barry Woodward is one of the preeminent foremost evangelists in this nation. He's gifted. People get saved. How many of you got people you want to see get saved, man? Let me see your hands. Huh? Bring them on Super Sunday because people get saved even when they don't even want to get saved. God uses him in that gift. Praise the Lord. And that's why, we're, that's why we're doing this. But I want, I want you to turn in your Bibles real quick right now um, to, well, just, to, just get your Bibles ready. There's going to be a lot of Scripture that's coming because I want, to, I want to speak to you about building the future. Lately, I've been on this page about building the future. I'm looking ahead. I'm, I'm seeing so many things in the future, so many things that are up ahead. You know, there are so many great people that are coming to our church we have such a diverse congregation um, that even our culture of church has to change. The way that we look at church, the way that we understand how we actually do church changes. Back in the day when we first started, we just had a group of junkies, man. Just a group of junkies that came and they had to come and they were coming here and this was a safe place for them and they would, they would be transformed and they would build and they would grow and, and we see you know, people's lives transform. But as God's grown us throughout the years, we're seeing people that come now with, you know, top jobs. We've got PhDs. We've got um, all sorts of degrees. We've got business owners, care workers, doctors. We've got lawyers. We've got sports professionals. Amen. We've got healthcare professionals. We've got business professionals. We've got architects and IT gurus and, you know what I mean, Jedi and all sorts of stuff. Amen. And we have all these different types of people that are coming. And sometimes you'll see that, you know, some people are not here one week and they're not here for a couple of weeks. It's, it's, it's okay. It's not that they've left the church. It's just that maybe they're working or they've had to go away or they're on business and stuff. It's just the way that things are. And we have to understand the way that we're, we are right now. But some of them still watch us online and that they're still part of the congregation. And if we add it up, everyone that watches us online with everyone that comes to two services, man, we've got hundreds and hundreds of people in this church. Can someone say amen? And you have to understand that the future is happening whether you like it or not. The future will come to pass whether we like it or not. And some people are still living in the past. When really and truly, we need to be preparing for the future. So I want to look at building the future. And I've been looking at this and praying about it and seeing it for what it is. And, and, and a couple of things I've understood is that it's always best to build the process that you're going to be a part of. It's always best to build the process that you're going to be a, become a part of. Some of you know you can live by accident. You can just get by. You can just, you know, flow with stuff. Or you can actually be a part of construction, constructing it. And it, it, that's, that's what we, we, we call sowing right now. We're sowing stuff for the future. So that then we know how to take care of what it is that we've sown so that we expect an outcome later on. Does everyone understand that, that principle? And there's a couple of things. There's three things, important concepts to understand, first of all, where, where this is concerned. And at the outset, the first one is that you have to trust the Lord and put Him first in everything. Can someone say Amen. 
Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 tells us this. It goes on from Jesus speaking about people's concerns in the world. And how many of you know we get concerned about stuff in, in life, right? Money, clothes, food. Hello. Some of us get more concerned with food than we should. Glory to God. And clothes, hallelujah. How I many of you know I like clothes? How I many of you like dressing, dressing up? Come on now. How many of you would like one day to be given the freedom of the Trafford Centre for one day? That you could go there and get anything you like. How many of you would like that? Let me see your hands. Wow. Some of you wouldn't like that. How many of you would like that? Why? Because we like it. How many of you would like to have a supermarket trolley run through Tesco, Sainsbury's, as there are weight trolls? Then you could just take trolleys all the way through, as many as you like, in, in a time limit, and just fill them things up. Huh? And Jesus speaks about all that, about the concerns of it. In verse 33 of that chapter, he tells us, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. What? Yeah, you're going to be able to dress nice. I don't see no shabby looking people in Victory Outreach. Are you with me? You're some of the best dressed, stylish looking dudes that there are. I also don't see any hungry people. Amen. Ain't no one with their, their, their belt, belt buckle touching their backbone in this church. Praise the Lord. And one of the reasons why is because we do put God first and God blesses us and he adds to us, right? Even when you ain't got nothing, even when you don't see him, he's working. Even when you don't feel it, he's working. Huh? I love that song. You never stop. I don't know why I'm doing it in, a, in that accent, praise the Lord, but it's, it sounds better than my accent doing it. I mean, if you know, Cockney accent does not sound good in any song except I'm, for, I'm forever blowing bubbles. You cannot sing that song in any other accent. You just sound ridiculous. So first of all, we've got to trust God. You've got to put him first. You might think that that's an elementary thing, but how many of you know, I, I, I guarantee that there's times you don't put God first. You tack him on, you add him on to the end with a little prayer of bless what I'm already doing, God. Huh? Instead of God, what do you want me to do? Then I know it's blessed. The second thing that, that, that you, have to, you have to be willing to keep God's work in the mix of your financial arrangements. This is another thing that bends people out of shape. They don't understand it. Because whether you understand it or not, you're paying into the system. You know what the system is? The system is what you're educated from a child to become a part of when you're an adult. That you're educated as a child to get into this system where you become a cog in a wheel of big business, of government, of all of those things that really make up civilization. But the system, you've heard me say it before, can be abused. We can just fall into it. Some people can be the tail and not the head. But you have to understand how the system works. And whether you like it or not, you're paying for the system. You're paying into the system. Right? You're paying tax on everything. You get tax for your wages. You get tax for driving too fast. You get tax for this and tax for that. Parking in the wrong place. One inch over the line. Amen? The system has ways of getting you to pay. Can someone say amen? Driving too fast is against the law. So that's a different thing. But... You know, 100 pound for going two miles over the limit? Come on. Liberty taken. But whether you understand it or not, you're paying into this system, and this is the structure that keeps us all in our place so that the cogs turn. We're all, we're all part of that. Huh? And that's not necessarily a bad thing. right? We want civilized. We don't want a free-for-all. We don't just want anarchy. But look what Jesus says about this in Luke chapter 20, verse 22 through 25. The, the, the scribes and the chief priests, the, the, the governmental system of Israel at that time, they were trying to trap him and, and, and they were trying to mess him up. And they asked him this question. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? Caesar 
was the emperor that was in charge of the Roman Empire that Judea and Israel was a part of at that time. So he was the big cheese. Their government controlled things. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But the Bible says that he perceived their craftiness and said to them, show me a denarius. Denarius is a form of money. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So you're part of this system. You have to pay tax and all the rest of it. But don't forget God's business in the mix of your worldly business. Amen. And that also includes money. And then the third thing is that we have to have the mindset that everything we are and everything we have belongs to God. As soon as I said money, it was like the oxygen was sucked out of the room. People just went like this. <laughs> money, 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 money. Money, 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 money. Huh? Let me say it again. Money. Turn around to your neighbor, say money. All right. Don't get bent out of shape with money, otherwise you'll never have any. If you're uncomfortable with talking about money in church, then don't think that you're going to be comfortable having money outside of church. See, we have to have the mindset that everything we are and everything we have belongs to God, and we are stewards, not owners. And our job is to take care of things that God has given us in the right way. Luke Again, quotes Jesus in chapter 12, verses 42 through 44. And it says, And the Lord replied, A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all things he owns. That was in the New Living Translation. In the New King James Version, it says steward. A steward. In the NIV, it says manager. In the Greek, the word is oikonomos. And it literally means a manager, an overseer, an employee in that capacity, by extension, a treasurer, or figuratively, a preacher of the gospel, a chamberlain, a governor, or a steward. It's someone that takes care of God's business, wherever it is. Looking after God's stuff is key. And when we do it right, we get a reward from that. Can someone say amen? amen? We see this in the timeline of VO Manchester right here. We, 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 we started off, as I said, with a bunch of junkies. I think our first ever tithe was 25 pounds. That was it. We had nothing, but we, we looked after that correctly. We looked after it right. We pay our tithes. We do our thing. And as we begin to grow and develop, we've applied God's principles of giving and stewardship and servanthood and then we've grown from a handful of people in a small room in a sports centre to where we are now in this multi-purpose building with a sanctuary, coffee shop, classrooms, offices, employed staff. We've got homes that run. And we just became, what was it we became? The homes. We were just recognised as a service provider in the city of Salford for our victory homes. Amen. So we're there when, on the drop downs on their website. You know, City West Housing, Salvation Army, Victory Outreach. Praise the Lord. Amen. But that's because of stewardship. It's because we've taken care of God's business. That means we've sacrificed our comfort at times so that we can do the right thing. But where we're going, how we're growing, we need to make more room. We need to upgrade our facilities. We need to take on more staff. Amen? So we need a plan. I mean, you know, God's been giving me a plan. And it's going to be unfolded and unrolled in the next month. And you're part of the plan. We're all part of the plan. Praise the Lord. The plan is workable. The plan is doable. But it's going to take you out of your comfort zone. But not too much. But no plan is worth much without God's principles as a foundation. Huh? 
So I want us to look into the Word of God at a particular time in the history of his people. And it was when God commanded them to build the tabernacle. And he, was build, he wanted them to build a place, a tabernacle, so that he could come and be with them in a very real and practical way. God is spirit, right? But he wanted to come and commune with his people in a place. Now God's people is the key thing, but there was a place that he also wanted so that he could manifest himself in that place amongst his people. Now, before we read, I don't want us to think that this is being equated, this building with the tabernacle of God. That this is the only place that God comes and moves and manifests himself and, and all that stuff. So let's get that out of the way. I just want us to recognize the key principles that the Bible speaks about in a project involved in building something for God. Is that okay? Amen. Exodus chapter 36. Please turn there in your Bibles. Exodus chapter 36. I'm going to be reading from verse 2 through verse 7. I'm reading in the New King James Version. Now if you've got a Bible, turn in your Bible. I know it gets put up on the screen, but don't be lazy. Because sometimes reading it yourself, you might want to mark something off, put something in your phone, make a note, or something like that. It says this, starts off in verse 2. It says, Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab, and every gifted artisan in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, everyone whose heart was stirred to come and do the work. And they received from Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of making the sanctuary. So they continued bringing to him free will offerings every morning. Then all the craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came each from the work he was doing, and they spoke to Moses, saying, check this out. I nearly the first time I ever read this, I nearly fell over. The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord has commanded us to do. I, one day I want someone to come and tell me, Pastor, you know what? Everyone's giving too much. People would stop them. People bring bringing too much. They want to serve too much. They want to give too much. They want to help too much. Stop them. Huh? I would fall over. So Moses gave a commandment and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp saying, let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from, from bringing for the material they had was sufficient for all the work to be done. Indeed, too much. Wow. Pastor Kevin, he gets up and does the, the offerings, the tithes and offerings. One day, I'd love it if I have to get up and take the mark off him and say, brother, go and sit down, man. We don't need to do this no more. It's okay. Time out. It's cool. We've got not just what we need, but more than we need to do what it is that we need to do. Can you imagine that? For some of you, it means nothing to you because you don't carry the weight of actually building anything in a practical way. But practically, those people that understand where the money goes and how we have to do what it is that we need to do and how we have to pray and how we have to believe and how we have to trust, man, what an amazing thing that would be. Huh? But I want to show you four points from this because I really believe that we're in a position now where when we sow, we're going to reap. And I'm not into all of the, the prosperity gospel stuff that has been abused, where if you do this, you do that, and if you don't do this, you ain't going to get that, and give to this, and do that, and do this. But the principles are exactly the way that the Bible speaks about them. Amen? If you, you sow, you will reap from that which you've sown. It is there. It is a, called the law of reciprocity. Amen? You get what you give. Any farmer knows this. Any businessman knows this. Bankers employ these principles. Four things. Number one, first thing I want, to, I want us to really get a grip of, really get in our hearts, is that God is more than enough. God is more than enough. Can someone say amen and help me out? God is more than enough. The God we serve is more than enough in every way for everything. The blood of Jesus is more than enough to free us from sin. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for that. 
I'm grateful that I don't have to keep going and paying for my sins every day and every week and every year through making sacrifices and offerings every day and every week and every year. But that he made a one-time offering, a one-time sacrifice, once and for all. And then the Bible says, then, and when he, then he went and sat down at the right hand. Do you know what this analogy is like? It's like an interest-only mortgage. When we first got a house, we had an interest-only mortgage because we had to get a mortgage by slipping through some technical gap. Amen. self cert mortgage. I don't even think they do them anymore. But we had an interest-only mortgage, but we were on the housing ladder. Hallelujah. Amen. But with an interest-only mortgage, what happens is the capital amount stays untouched. And all you do is pay the interest on the capital amount. And you have to keep going back and paying the interest and paying the interest and paying the interest. But it, it never ever goes down. You never ever get closer to ownership. This was the sacrificial system of the Hebrews. This was what was employed. The capital amount of sin was always there hanging over everyone's head. But they would go every time that they, something happened, they would have to go and they would have to pay the interest with bulls and goats and rams and stuff like that. And then only once a year, the high priest could come into the, the Holy of Holies. Huh? The Kadosh, Kadoshim. And he would come once a year and he would make atonement. He would be able to speak to God face to face or, or you know, obscured with incense. And he would be able to offer up atonement for the people once a year. But then they'd have to go back and do it again. And they'd have to go back and do it again. And all you were doing was paying off the interest. But I mean, you know, when Jesus came, and he was like us in every way, he suffered, he was tempted in every way, yet was without sin. He qualified with his life and with his death to pay off not just the interest on our sin, but the whole capital amount of our sin. He paid it off. So now we don't have to pay the interest. We have ownership, full ownership. Praise God. People don't even understand that. They think, well, you know, I've sinned. I've got to go through hoops. No, you just have to repent, change your mind, go back to God, ask for forgiveness, come under his blood, understand that he's paid it all. Where people get tripped out is that they, they keep going back and hiding and trying to do it themselves. But Jesus has paid it all off. The blood of Jesus was more than enough to, to free us from sin. The Word of God is more than enough to transform us. You get a Word, you get a Scripture, and you take that to heart. And that Word starts working in your heart. And it starts changing things. And you look in the mirror of God and His Word, and you see things that don't belong there anymore. And you say, God, take them. But you wouldn't know what needed to go unless you saw the perfection that you could have in the future. The Holy Spirit is more than enough to make us new creations. Come on now, help me out. The Holy Spirit, when you're born again, you're born of the Spirit. Spirit comes in, changes us, fills us, connects us to God, makes us new. And then he takes us all the way through. He's our teacher, he's always there, he's always with us and he empowers us. Wow! Gives us passion and gives us uh, uh, abilities that are beyond their natural abilities. Huh? It was the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the blood of Jesus that set me free from 10 years of heroin addiction. There wasn't anything else around me. It was what was taking place in me that worked its way out. The plan of God is more than enough to keep us growing forward to a life of eternal fruitfulness. You know when you were born, but with, through God, you start to understand why. Why am I here on this earth? Why, what is my purpose? What is my meaning? All of this is because God is more than enough. The grace of God is more than enough to keep us saved and serving God. Huh? Or oh, when things get tough, he's more than enough. Come on now. So write a song about that. Come on, write a rap about that. Huh? I ain't gonna do that, shall I? No, I'm not gonna do it. Huh? When things get tough, it's more than enough. Hallelujah. Ain't no bluff. 
So good stuff. Huh? When the going gets tough. <laughs> huh? It's more than enough. Praise the Lord. The amazing thing to me is that he doesn't need us to do anything. God don't need us to do anything. Are you with me? What a, bl- what a buzz. He don't need us. He's all sufficient. But the beautiful thing that blows me away is that he gives us the privilege to be a part of his plan. And when we realize this and when we make ourselves available to be used, God uses us. He does. Second thing, God uses people like us. God uses people. He doesn't need people, but he uses people. He partners with us. What an amazing thing that we should be partnering with the Holy Spirit, the one that hovered over the waters, that we should be partnering with Jesus, the Logos, the Word of God, the one who upholds everything, that everything was created through, that we're partnering with the God of all creation, us little peanuts on the earth, little ants, but God uses us. Throughout scriptures, we see God using people to do his work on earth. Noah built the ark that saved the world. Praise God, man. Noah, a man, built the ark that saved the world. From that ark came out all of your ancestors. Huh? And I'm not talking about the animals. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Abraham went on a lifelong mission trip to prepare the way of faith for his people, God's people later on. Moses led God's people out of slavery and through the wilderness. David united the people of God into one kingdom. Solomon built a temple for God's glory. The prophets represented God upon the earth. And the apostles followed Jesus. And then he sent them into the world with his message. And then there's us. Then there's you and me. Living epistles. Huh? Written on our hearts. The truth written on our hearts. When you go out and you speak to someone about Jesus, you're like Paul, you're like Timothy, you're like those people that received from him. You go out and you represent God in front of all the people. Amazing! God uses people. In this historical account in Exodus, we find him using people to finance and build his meeting place. And you'll notice that if you read the account, that all the necessary stuff didn't just appear supernaturally. An angel didn't just come and provide it. Huh? The people provided it. The people provided it. Money, materials, and manpower. It came from the people. I think there's two, re- two main reasons why God does things this way. Because he loves bringing his kids to work. Amen? He just loves bringing his kids to work, man. Come in, son. See, come in, daughter. See what it is that daddy does. Huh? Amazing. And then also, he knows that wherever you invest in, you value more. Wherever you've had a hand in, you're going to take care of. Are you with me? Number three, I'm getting through this. God blesses willing sacrifices. God blesses willing sacrifices. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the apostle speaks to, to, to the recipients of, the, of this letter, and he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That means that you want to you be holy? Get involved in the things of God. Come before God and say, God, this is me. Holiness, holy things were things that were separated for God's use. Holy articles, holy vessels. They weren't just off on doing their own thing. They were, they were, they were set apart. For God's use. How many of you want to be holy? See, there ain't no option. God says to his people, you shall be holy as I am holy. He don't give us an option. We try and take an option that's not even there. Huh? Well, no, I don't fancy doing that. Oh, tough. You're either in or you're out. Are you with me? You're either holy or you're unholy. And the way to become holy is not just to, to try and live sinlessly. Huh? You know there's only one word in the Bible that, is, that says sinless. And amatos. And it's when Jesus has brought this woman who has been caught in adultery and, and, and they say, what do you think of her? And he's writing stuff in the dirt. 
probably writing down all their sins. And then he says, if anyone among you is an amatos, cast the first, first stone, without sin, without the capacity to sin, sinless. It's the only time in the Bible that that word is used. But you go through the book of Hebrews and you see the word perfect. You see holy. You see sanctified. And we can become perfect because of him. It's in your position, not your performance. Oh, you ain't catching this. Your performance comes from your position. You don't perform yourself into your position. You don't have to be sinless before you can be holy. You come and you commit yourself to God. And then as you are set apart for his purpose, then all of a sudden things start to fall in place and you start doing the things that they should be done. Help me out. Huh? See, when your life is already a willing sacrifice, your wallet or your purse or your bank account can easily follow. People that don't give, are you really a, a holy, holy willing sacrifice? See, God don't force anyone. He's not a tyrant. He's all powerful. He's all sovereign, but he's yet a loving father. More often than not, things don't get done in God's kingdom, not because of inability, but because of unwillingness. Unwillingness. Huh? Not willing. And that can come about through simple immaturity, rebellion because of sin or a hard heart. It can come about because of a lack of knowledge of the need or how things work practically. And you'd be surprised how many people don't think about the practical needs of running a church. They just turn up and that's cool. But several times God has revealed that he's looking for willingness. Exodus chapter 35, verses 4 and 5 says, Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord. Gold, silver, and bronze. Some people, when they complain about tithes and offerings, they say, Well, it's all about corn and wheat and animals. Well, no, it's not. In this instance, it was about money. It's all about everything. Exodus uh, chapter 35, 20 through 22 says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. And then this is key. It says, Then everyone came whose heart was stirred. Everyone whose spirit was willing. And they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting, for all its service, and for all its holy garments. People that were stirred. People that were willing. No one was forced. They came, both men and women, as many as had a willing heart. They bought earrings and nose rings, rings and necklaces, all jewelry of gold. That is every man who made an offering of gold to the Lord. Verse 29 of 35, it says, The children of Israel brought a free will offering to the Lord, all the men and women whose hearts were willing to bring material for all kinds of work which the Lord by the hand of Moses had commanded to be done. And then even when the work was going on, people were still bringing stuff. In chapter 36, verse 3, it says, And they received from Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of making the sanctuary, so they continued bringing to him free will offerings every morning. Eventually there was more than enough to complete the work. We've read about this. Then all the craftsmen that were doing all the work of the sanctuary came each from the work he was doing. And they spoke to Moses saying, the people bring too much. It's more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. And the result was that the people became so generous and so enthusiastic about what was taking place. They were so involved in the process that they had to literally be restrained from giving any more. And even up, you know when revival hits a church, because people's hearts become stirred and they become generous. Not just with money, with their time. They always want to be there because they know God's in the house. When God's in the house, I want to be where God is. Imagine the cloud just come, boom, or you saw an angel. We've had all that before. You, where, where would you want to be? You'd want to be in the house of the Lord, right? Huh? Football, forget that. You know what I mean? Huh? Our girl, whatever it is you watch. Amen. Love Island. Woo. Someone once said, put your hand up if you watch Love Island. Now slap yourself with that hand. Hallelujah. 
Amen. But you forget all that. You want to be in the house of the Lord. You want to use your talent for, the, for God's glory. You want to write for God. You want to sing for God. You want to play for God. You want to do technical stuff for God. You want to do Facebook for God, Instagram for God, YouTube for God. You want to cook for God. You want to teach the children for God. You want to do security for God. You want to ask the people, great people for God. You want to clean for God. Whatever it is. Oh, help me out, Jesus. I'm getting filled with the Spirit. And I don't know if you are. What an amazing thing to happen. It was actually more than enough, which brings me to the last point. Number four, we invest in what we value. We invest in what we value. Huh? You value Sky, you're going to invest in Sky TV. You value your clothes, your nails, your hair, your white teeth. Huh? Praise the Lord, you've got teeth, some of you. Glory to God. Coming from the background you came from. I had a friend in America who was a, a meth addict and he was always messing around around the church and he wouldn't come into the home because of his girlfriend who was a meth addict. You know, methamphetamine, right? I said, what's the matter with you, brother? He said, oh, it's my girlfriend, man. I, I love her. He said, those eyes, that smile, that tooth. <laughs> Just grips me, man. Huh? But we only give how much we think of the work of God and the God of the work. An atheist I know makes this common, he, 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 made, he always does this. He made this commonly mistaken statement, right? He said, how comes when the church needs money, the people are asked for it? But when the people need money, the church tells them to go away and pray for it. You ever heard that? Huh? And what a bad concept. What a misunderstanding. What a wrong concept. Something that can be crushed and folded like a wet biscuit. Right? Here's the, here's the thing. The mistake he's making is twofold. First, the church is not just a building or a place you go to. If that's your mentality, then you're into churchianity. Huh? It's not just a place. It's not just a building. The church is the people. The church is you. And the church is me. The church is us. So when we give, we're actually providing for ourselves. You're providing for your kids to be educated. You're providing for your drug addicted son to be set free or daughter to be set free. You're providing for an education. You're providing for a community. You're providing for eternity. And then the other thing he gets wrong about this is that there's massive help from the church community in terms of the people. Huh? There's debt advice, there's counselling, there's employment, there are subsidies, and there's even practical help. You know how many people we've helped out financially to pay their rent, to get shopping, to get this, to get healthy, to go abroad, to, get, to do what God wants them to do, to come in from abroad, to get their family members in? Do you know how much we do as a church? Not just this church, but the church across this city and this nation. Amazing stuff. So there are two things he gets wrong. But we invest in what we value. Do you trust me? It's very important. You know something I've come to understand? Is people don't leave churches, people leave pastors. People leave leaders. They don't leave organizations, they're neutral things. They leave people. In this church, a couple of people have left us over time. They've come to me, they say, Pastor, I want to leave. I say, You can't. They're like, What? They will get all chesty. What do you mean I can't? So you can't leave because you never joined. We don't have membership, we have partnership. If you don't want to partner with us anymore, then God bless you. But we're doing a good thing. Why should we come down and argue over here and do this and do that? We're not going to do that. We've got a mission. We've got a vision. We've got somewhere we're going. We've got people to reach. We've got things that we need to do. We've got transformation we need to see come. We've got darkness that needs to be kicked out. We've got the life of God that needs to be brought into situations. We've got God that needs to be brought into situations in the city that we're in, in the nation that we're in, and in the generation that we're in. 
top of this misunderstanding, there's quite a tension in Christianity. We say that we believe that God is more than enough, but then we see His church either doesn't have enough or has just enough just to get by. And then we complain that the church is failing and things are falling and that, oh, woe is me. But imagine when there's a vision and a mission that people want to see God glorified. They want to know that His presence is available. They want to see opportunities and community develop and grow. And so they come and they give and they invest because they value their future. They value what's going to take place. They build the future and they start right now. Imagine that. There will be nothing impossible for God's church. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We could have the best buildings in the city. We could have schools. We could have rehabs. We could have all of that stuff. It's not because God can't supply. It's usually because His people won't. But when people are given the opportunity to will and invest in the purpose and the will of the Almighty God and they respond willingly, there's no limit on what can be accomplished for His honour and His glory. I'd like you all to stand. I'm not taking up an offering right now. Just letting you know, a lot of you were tucking your toes in, hiding your purses and your wallets, uh, shuffling out a little pound coin or something to flip in the offering basket and leaving all the 20s alone. I'm not taking up an offering right now. This is not what this is about. This is about our hearts. This is about the condition of our hearts. This is about sowing a seed right now of faith, of honesty, that is going to reap a benefit in the future. That's what this is about right now. This is your heart. Where's your heart at? Where's your heart at? Search your heart. Let God search your heart. There is going to come a time when we're asked to give. There is going to come a time when we have to invest. That day is not today. But today is a day of shifting priorities. Being honest. Having a look. What are you investing? What you value. What do you value? As for me and my house, I value the life that I have because it wasn't promised to me. 23 years ago, I became a Christian and I don't know that if I hadn't become a Christian if I were to be alive today. In fact, even if I would have lasted to the end of that year in 1995, whether I would have been stabbed or shot. And there's been times when people have tried to kill me out in the world. I bear the scars. I've had friends that have been killed. I've had friends that have hung themselves, killed themselves, overdosed. I have friends that are still in jail now, 23, 24 years later. I thank God every day for His grace and His salvation. And as for me and my house, I thank God for my wife, ex-drug addict, healed of hepatitis, an overcomer of cancer. I thank God for our two children that don't ever have to live that life or go down that route. I thank God for the people in this church who have come to an understanding and a knowledge and an experience of the living God and now your children and your children's children can have a different destiny. I thank God. I value that. I value the fact that God has been faithful. I value the fact that He's never let us down. I value the fact that now some of you are married now you've got jobs, now you've got houses and careers by the grace of God. And so I will give and I will serve and I will sow my time and my talent and my treasure into God's kingdom. And you know the funny thing is, the more I do it, the bigger my opportunities become. I want us to pray right now. Time's done. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, Whatever people think, whatever suspicions and cynicism of people's hearts, the fact is that you want your church to grow. We leave the building of it to you. Jesus, you said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. But God, we are your people, we are your stewards that take care of that church. 
in partnership with you. And Lord, we want to do the best we can. Search our hearts. Stir our hearts. That we will begin to make decisions now that are going to reap benefits later. We give you glory. We praise you in this place. We magnify your name. I'm not making an altar call today. We're going to worship the Lord. And you're going to be honest with Him in your chair where you're at. Just lift up your hands and just worship Him and just be honest. Be, be Connect with Him right now. Let Him search your heart. Let Him search your mind. Speak to you. Build the future now, my God. Build the future now. Begin the process. For some of you, He's been doing the underpinning. He's been digging the footings out. He's been doing the drainage. He's been doing the work inside. For some of you, the work inside is okay, but now He wants to accelerate the work on the upscale, on the outside. And he wants to do it, but in all of us, He's building something. Jesus, Jesus, come on, let's worship Him. What makes you passionate? Father, we, my prayer, God, is that I want, us to, I want us as a church here, this ministry, to play our part in the move that you want to make in this, this city, in this nation, in this generation. May we be positioned and prepared. We're doing everything we can, God, to get positioned and prepared. But Lord, there's a few more things you want us to do. There's some more steps you want us to take. There's some more things that we want to engage with. And Lord, we don't want to miss out. We don't want to miss the moment. We don't want to miss that place and that part that you have for us. 
So God, move upon our hearts from this day forward. As the plan develops and as the plan is in place for us to see greater things take place in the future, may we continually be searching our hearts and reminding ourselves that there is more to life than what we see and what we taste and what we feel. There is more. My God, even when we don't see you, you're working. And when we don't feel you, you're working. And you're working for our benefit. Because you want us to partner with you in this great work. Lord, we give you glory in this place. Holy Spirit, just move in this place and continue to move and don't stop. We love you and we glorify you. We value you. And We want to work with you and for you, oh God. From that position of love, from that place of fellowship. We trust you, God. We trust you. With all that we have and with all that we are and all that we own. We trust you, God. Move. Come like a wave, come like a wind. And we give you the glory for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you today. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Don't forget, if you're staying up for after the second service, there's going to be food and fellowship and stuff. It ain't coming home. Amen. But if you fancy a little bit of football and a little bit of food and fellowship, then this is the place to be. God bless you today. We love you. Don't forget, take these, give them to someone. Amen. Invite them. Invite them. Next week, Odsu Park, right? Odsu Park. Take your city. And then the week after that is going to be Super Sunday. Amen. God bless you today.